So I want to tell you something about myself that no one knows except Lisa and just a few other staff members. And what we're going to be talking about is going to make some people feel uncomfortable. All right, so let's just put it out there. All right, so Lisa and I are in uh, Turkey a couple years ago. Um, I'm there with a consortium of biblical scholars and archaeologists and some pastors where we're going around to the seven churches of Revelation. Um, and anyway, there's, there's a bunch of scholars. We're in this city. We're at this hotel the very first night. Um, Lisa and I are eating, tucked away in a corner. She's super extroverted. I'm super introverted. As always, usually the introvert wins. So I'm in the corner with my wife, tucked away, and then the preeminent scholar today on the churches of Revelation walks by and says, can we sit here? And my wife, what does she say? Of course. And I'm like, Ooh. you know, so, so I'm incredibly uncomfortable around this brilliant man. I have all of his commentaries. He is just um, an amazing person and everything. And halfway through the conversation, he's talking, and I couldn't hear him talk anymore, and felt constricted immediately in my body. And I had this image of arrows coming at him from every side. So from that point on, for the rest of the dinner, there's this vision that I'm having of him. And I, I, like I, I, it was very difficult for me to talk, and I'm doing the best that I can, but words were given to me in, in that, like in the sense that this person is under attack. And so then later after the meal, Lisa was like, that was great, wasn't it? And I'm like, well, first of all, as an introvert, no. And second, uh, I had this thing happen again. She's like, oh, okay, well, what was it? And what was the, um, two years ago, um, I am praying for our church like I do and people in the church. And then same thing happened and I just felt like I was supposed to go and gather the whole staff around and tell them that this coming spring, this was a few years ago, something bad is going to happen. And then I'm supposed to go around with everyone and say, hey, um, are, is everybody on the team? Are you good? I had no idea what it was that was gonna happen, but when it did happen, I was absolutely, utterly blown away by it. And people were like, that's what this was. And I completely forgot about it. I'm at lunch uh, with our teaching team a few years ago. There's a Christian celebrity and they're discussing this celebrity and this person is a comedian and a committed Christian and, and on and on and on. And as I'm talking at lunch in the middle of um, General says chicken, it happens again. And they kept talking and I said, within a few months this person is, their life is going to fall apart in front of all of us. And then I completely forgot about it. And then um, some four or five weeks later, staff member texted me a link and said, did you see this? You called this, like you went into detail exactly what was gonna happen and it actually happened exactly the way that you said. And I'm like, don't tell anybody about this. And so for 30 years I've been embarrassed by this. I didn't wanna tell anyone. Lisa and I would have lunch and we would go back to the car and she was like, so how was it great? And I would say, he's hiding something. 
And what? And I'm like, I don't, I, I can't, I don't want to say anything just in terms of privacy. We have another conversation. She's not telling the truth. Um, another conversation. We're talking, and later I'm like, he's seen prostitutes in Germany. And I haven't wanted to tell anyone, first and foremost, because it's really hard being friends with a guy like that. Right, there's this story in the Old Testament of the prophet Elijah that there is this enemy of Israel that kept going to battle with Israel and Israel kept beating them. And then the king was like, who, who's a traitor? Who keeps telling people our plans to the Israelites? And then um, it says in 2 Kings 6, 2, none of us, my Lord, none of us are a traitor. But Elijah, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel, the very words you speak in your bedroom. So it's kind of hard being pals with someone like that. And I've never, ever, ever, you know I have never shared this with anyone. The second reason I want to do that is because there are these like really kooky, snake-handling churches on TV and pastors and that sort of thing. And I didn't want to be associated with that in any way, shape, or form. So I didn't tell anyone, including my kids, until today. So I'm taking a risk. We're, talk, we're starting a new series called, What is the Holy Spirit? And in the early church, every Christian knew what the Holy Spirit was and what it did. Paul told the church that he started in Greece. We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also how. How did the gospel come to them? With power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. When he talks about the, the sermon to the Hebrews, it says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And to the church Paul started in southern Turkey in his first missionary journey, he asked them, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard. And so the Holy Spirit was all that these people had. The Holy Spirit showed up and changed people's lives, sometimes in miraculous ways. But compare that to the Holy Spirit today in modern day Christianity. Um, one survey conducted by LifeWay Research found that 60% of the evangelical survey respondents, churches like us, believe that the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. So what is the Holy Spirit and what does it do? I want you to grab a pen, I want you to grab notes, because we're gonna go through what the Bible teaches, not what I think. And so. What I want you to write down is first, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. The Holy Ghost was a translation of the 1614 King James Version of the Bible. They translated it Holy Ghost rather than Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost. It's not a spirit or an inanimate force. The Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity. So let's unpack that. The Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity. One of the really weird, cool things about the God that we worship is that the God we worship has chosen to show up and manifest himself three different ways. So we read this, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the God of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one God, three persons. We don't worship three different gods. A lot of Jewish believers uh, condemned Christianity because they felt that it was polytheism, the worship 
of more than one God. We only worship one God that shows up three different ways. Matthew chapter 28, how are we supposed to baptize people? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is another way of saying, baptize them in the name of God. God shows up three different ways. A way to think of this is, is that the Father creates, the Son saves, and the Holy Spirit indwells and empowers. The Father creates, the Son saves, and the Holy Spirit empowers. Colossians 2, 9 says about Jesus, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity, the fullness of the deity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, some translate this, the Godhead lives in bodily form. So there aren't three gods. So it's, a, it's weird but I think the best way to understand it is to look at it this way. So there's the Father. There's the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're all God. The Son is not the Father. The Son is is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. But the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. One God showing up three different ways. It's vitally important that you understand this because if you don't understand this, church to you will be relegated to a place that you go, activities that you engage in, and then you go about with the rest of your life. What Christianity is, is that God has created, the Son came to save, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you so that you can have a conversational relationship with God. Some of you grew up in churches and denominations where you only had a relationship with God the Father. You would memorize prayers. You would sit, you would stand, you would kneel, you would go and talk to some other guy that would, you would confess your sins to this guy. And it was like here you were at a distance talking to the Father through this other dude. Christianity has absolutely nothing to do with that. You can go to the Father directly through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables you to pray to the Father. Okay, well, I don't know why I have such a time. There we go. Okay. Let's have a quiz, all right? You guys like quizzes? You don't like quizzes? Come on, you like quizzes. Here's a picture, okay? Is this one thing or three things, right? Because there's the shell, there's the yolk, and then I forgot the, I, I, I looked it up. There's, a, there's like an actual scientific name for the white stuff, all right? Okay, so is this one thing or three different things? This is one thing, right? We all agree. So this is not too foreign to us. We're used to an egg. We don't call, I would like yolks today, or I would like the shells, or I would like this, right? Here's another picture. Here's another quiz. Let's see how you do with this one. Is this three different things, or is this one thing? Right? Like it's, there's ice. This is H2O in a solid form. H2O in a liquid form is water. H2O in a, in a gaseous form is water vapor. One thing or three different things? You know the answer. One thing. So we're used to this in our life. This is not unlike anything that we experience in life. There is a tree. There's the trunk, the roots, and the leaves right? A person, 
A woman can be what? A daughter, a mother, a si help me out, sister, <laughs> sister, other thing. You know what I'm saying? All the things. Help me out, right? All right. So, so why did God chose, choose to show up in three different ways? Well, here's the way that the Bible explains it. First off, God creates the world and he creates us and then we blow it up like we always do. We always screw stuff up. So God, in order to, to fix us and to allow us to come back to a relationship, needs to become a human being. So now you have the Father and the Son. The problem with this issue is when Jesus came, and I want you to know Jesus was limited to one human body. Jesus couldn't be in Jerusalem and Galilee at the same time, right? And so we see him with his disciples promise. He says, listen, very truly, I tell you, it's good that I'm going away. You guys are sad and stuff, but I'm telling you, it's better. Because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, it's important that you understand this word advocate I should have just created a slide here. So uh, in Greek, it is um, so it's two words, para and um, kletos, which comes from kaleo, which means this is beside, and this means to call. So when Jesus described the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send to you the paraclete. You've probably heard that as a transliteration out of the Greek. The paraclete or the one who I call to come by your side. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is Jesus because he only had one body couldn't be with you and your grandmother in Texas, right? At the same time. So it's better that he leaves because now God can now be with you, your grandmother in Texas, the people in China, people in California, that sort of thing, okay? It's very, very important that you understand that, that the Holy Spirit is the one that is called to be right by your side. This is why we talk about the Holy Spirit being a conversational relationship now with God. For those of us who then become disciples of Jesus, this will freak you out. He comes to actually live inside of you. So rather than Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with two guys and they're in a conversation and rather than the Holy Spirit walking beside you as you're going to school or out of work, God is now inside of you. I know you can't get rid of him. He's actually living inside of you. Do you think for a second that the God of the Old Testament and New Testament, the creator of the world, would come and live inside of you and not want to make some changes. I don't get to clean this place up. And would want to have a conversation with you. Would want to lead you and guide you. That's what the Holy Spirit is. And so the Holy Spirit can be present with all people at all times in all places. It's like I have Jesus with me. You have Jesus, I have Jesus. You and you and you. The people in Kenya, China, and unfortunately the people in Dallas. Like it, it, it can be everywhere. So the other thing is that when God shows up in spirit, then God can be everywhere at once. That's why Jesus said, it's better if I leave because now God can be everywhere inside of people. If you don't get that, the rest of this stuff is not gonna make any sense. 
If your view of Christianity is coming to a building, sitting down, and this is where the guy does stuff. God does stuff, and then you leave. You're going to miss what Christianity is all about. I will put a spirit in them. I'm not going to deal with the hardened heart, it says in the Old Testament. There's this prophecy that my spirit is now going to be inside of them. Not the temple in Jerusalem, but inside people. So what does the Holy Spirit do then? First is, the Holy Spirit, like I just said, comes to live inside of us at conversion. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of you. Why is this important? Because if you're a mom, and you're trying to think through a situation and a decision that you need to make for your son or your daughter, like human wisdom is, I am going to get advice. I am going to weigh the pros and cons. I'm gonna have thinking patterns and I'm gonna eliminate straw man theories and everything that you can do. But you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have God inside of you. And God wants to lead and guide you. And he wants to do stuff. I was doing an internship, and this is another one of these weird things. I'm doing an internship at a church where they would send a group of people that would go up and serve at a week of camp. And so the staff of the church went up to Northern Ohio to Round Lake Christian Assembly, and they brought me, I was an intern at this church, and they allowed me to speak. Mother came up to me and said, um, so I'm dropping off my son, and the son just is completely distraught. She said, here's a bag, and this is his migraine medication. He's going to get a migraine, it's just a matter of when. And um, so what I need you to do, because I was the counselor in charge of this whole wing of boys, right? So I, he's going to come to you and say, it's time, and that you're going to begin giving him a series of these pills. And then he, I, what I need you to do is you're going to put a wet towel over his face, and then he's going to lay down. And about five hours later, he's going to come out of it, and then you're going to give him these pain pills, on and on. I get migraines. I, I wasn't done at the time, but I get them now. I get I understand migraines. So I speak. There's like 600 kids. It was super fun. There were 600 kids here. It was so much fun. And I was so excited. And you can be so animated, sort of like at kids camp, right? You know, when you have, you know, 600 kids in a room and the little boy comes up to me afterwards and he, he taps me and he says, it's time. And so I say, okay, so I go get the medicine. And I said, you know what? And then I just, I feel it again. Would you mind if I pray for you? Just, just that, would you mind if I pray for you? And I just put my hand on his shoulder and I said, God, would you please take away the migraine? Seconds later, he looks up and said, what did you do? And I said, I didn't do anything. And then he just took off. And the rest of the week of camp, he never came to me. Now, I just, I'm not saying that God is going to talk to us all the time. I don't even like the words that God is talking to us. Because I hate the way televangelists. But I think God nudges us and leads us and guides us. And there are a bunch of Christians who are not availing themselves of that because they don't believe God can do that. Here's the second thing the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit came to give us boldness to share the gospel. Um, Jesus said, listen, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. When you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Like, am I the only one that's like super chicken to share my faith with people? Come on, raise your hand. Am I literally okay? I, the rest of you are awesome. And I am. I, I would, you would think I wouldn't be, but I am. I really, it scares me. Um, here's another scripture verse. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I'm at Ohio State University, first year in undergraduate school. I'm eating at this Chinese restaurant and I see this Muslim man with full garb, the full deal. And he was talking to people, preaching to people out on the sidewalk. And I, again, I felt I was like, go share Jesus with him. And I'm like, yeah, right, you go share Jesus with him. I am, no, I'm not doing that. So I just felt this power, like I can do this. So I went and I shared Jesus with him. He was yelling at me the whole time. I'm like, listen, this is what Jesus means and this is what you do and that sort of thing. The very next day, I'm walking to, to class and this guy's out in the same spot speaking people but this time, he's changed his message. He was telling people about Jesus. And I went up to him and I was like, what happened? He said, the God that you told me about came to me last night in a dream and said, listen to that man. And I, this is what I said. You're freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> he said, and then he said, can you take me to your leader? <laughs> It was like, you obviously have no idea what you're doing. Take me to your leader. Exact words. It was so funny. And then I took him to another church and that sort of thing. But that, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives you power to go. And then it's not just you going and sharing the message of Jesus. It's Jesus, or the Holy Spirit going before you and in you going and share that. Third, the Holy Spirit comes to guide us. I have much more to say, Jesus said, more than now you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. This is how we got our Bible. Jesus said, I'm going to send the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, to come beside the disciples and to inspire them to write down the sayings of Jesus. So on one hand, we have the final complete revelation cannot be added to Bible. Not a jot or tittle can be added to this. On the other hand, with that complete revelation there, God can lead us and guide us in our everyday life to make decisions. Here is a map of the disciples. They're trying to make a decision. Paul's like, I really want to go to Ephesus. Ephesus was like the modern day uh, Philadelphia. Way over here was the modern day Rome. He's like, man, I got to go to Ephesus. And then he had a dream. And it said, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, have been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia during the night. Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul had seen the vision and we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. So some of the dreams that you have, you wonder if it's just a dream. And the reality is 99.99% .99 of the time, it's just a dream, it's what your brain does, or you had too many carbs that day. It's weird stuff. If I go and I try to get an extra hour of sleep, I always dream strange stuff, right? That's just what your brain does. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak through dreams. Usually God communicates his direction for us through dreams, messages when we sleep, visions, dreamlike images and messages while we're awake, or prophecies, just insights that come to us. They're like, I, I, 
talking about the airport. I shouldn't get on this plane. I'm like, this makes no sense. I'm tired and I want to go home. But this plane turns around and gets in all kinds of weather and it's four days delayed and all this kind of stuff. And then maybe that happens to you. Four different times the apostle John talked about being taken up in the spirit. That's what I'm talking about. This feeling of, it's more than I just had an idea. It's more than you just have an idea. There have been times that have happened to you this sense that was different and you blew it off. And what I'm saying is, I don't want you to blow those things off anymore. I want you to begin paying attention to maybe God is trying to lead you and say something to you. Um, We are told... Paul told the new believers in Thessalonica, he said, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then he says, notice this, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them, hold on to what is good, and reject every kind of evil. I just want to say this was never taught to me in the church where I grew up, ever. Because honestly, this is what I was told. That's something the freaky Pentecostals do. So I have some rules for someone saying, hey. So number one, anybody that begins a sentence with, God told me to tell you, should be ignored. I have ears, if God wants to tell me something, he can tell me, doesn't need to tell you. Now, that's different if you have close friends, family members, or your people that you trust, you're in a small group. Sometimes you can really be praying about something, and then a friend will say, I was praying for you today, and I don't know, maybe I just had this nudge that maybe you ought to consider this. That ought to be listened to. Number two, anybody that truly has genuine supernatural promptings almost never wants to share them with other people. This is the first time in 30 years I've shared this. Number three, but God leading you by speaking to you must be honored and respected. So this is the last thing I'm gonna say. There's all kinds of things that we're gonna get into in this series. We're gonna talk about supernatural gifts. We are not a Pentecostal church. I don't speak in tongues. I'm not trying to get everybody to do some crazy stuff. But maybe you have a supernatural spiritual gift of encouragement. That is a spiritual gift. Maybe you have a supernatural spiritual gift of teaching. Maybe you have a supernatural spiritual gift of giving. There are all these different gifts that just a lot of people aren't using. So Lisa and I, um, we're having this conversation. We're on the Perkiomen. We love the Perkiomen Trail. Any trail in this area where we can walk, we just love going on the Perkiomen Trail. Or let me just reword this. She loves dragging me out to walk on the Perkiomen Trail. So we're on the Perkyoma Trail, and she knows I want to farm. Like, I want to farm. I want to farm, and you guys know why I want to farm. This is not just about being a farmer. It's about, it's about food and where our food comes from. And I think some of the people that ought to be honored most in this region are the ones that are paid the least and are honored the least, and that's our farmers. 1% of this country, 1.5% of this country produces the food for the rest of us. And we treat them like it's a, like it's a, anyway. So we're on the Perkyama Trail, we're walking, and she just says, have you prayed about a farm yet? And I said, no, not yet. And I said, have you? And she said, no, I, I haven't felt led to do that yet. Now, what I want to say is I really want one, but I haven't prayed for it yet. And that's because there is this thing that we're going to get into that, well, we'll pick that up next time. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you did not leave us alone. You sent the Spirit. And in our very Cartesian, linear, logic, mindset, our need to control everything. You are a person that cannot be controlled. We can stifle you. 
We can ignore you, but we can't control you. So we pray that as we study the scripture, that you would open our, up our eyes to how, in even greater ways, you want to begin to lead and guide us through the power of your spirit, just like what happened in the Christians in the first century, in the second century, in the third century. We want to experience that. So we pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.